Hi, friends. Welcome back to With Great People, the podcast for high-performance teams. I'm Richard Kasparowski. Our special guest today is Matthew McCarthy. Now, this is a really special episode for me because Matthew is uh, an, an old friend, a very dear friend, a friend from high school days. He's currently the CEO of Ben & Jerry's. And you know, here's how I know him best. Uh, so I know Matthew best as the former lead singer of a relatively obscure and definitely very underrated rock band from the late 1980s. To support this podcast, visit my website, kasparowski.com. Matthew, hello. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's a super huge treat to see you again. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> Together. <laughs> it really is. It's definitely a treat for me. I just did the non-standard Matthew McCarthy interview. They sent me the official, uh, the, the, the non-standard Matthew McCarthy introduction. They sent me the standard introduction that I was supposed to read. I didn't do it. Good thing I don't work for Ben and Jerry's. They would fire me. <laughs> is there anything you want to add on to that intro? Probably not much. I think I think I'm gonna scrap what I have and like readopt yours. Even if I'm doing some big high conference, I think I may say, "Read this." Is this really what? Yeah, I read that. <laughs> uh, that. That's way cooler. I know it's not much. I um, no, I work for Ben and Jerry's. I've been with Ben and Jerry's for about two and a half years, and I've been with the parent company Unilever for about twenty three or so years. And um, yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, it, it, okay, and I gotta say this this isn't in you know I, people know I have this script that I that I read off of. Um, I just held it up to the camera for people who are listening to the audio only podcast. When you first started working for Unilever, I was like, eh, big company, boring. I'm not interested in that at all. But Ben and Jerry's, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did, was this like, I don't know, I, you know, I've been following you over the years. You've definitely been been having fun in, in big corp land. Is, how did you end up at Ben & Jerry's? Uh, I actually am not fully sure of that. Uh, you know, and I, it, it, I, be, I, mean, I mean that uh, honestly, is I, uh, I, I actually started my career working with my dad in the family business. He worked in business and then he didn't want to do it anymore. And he bought a small, very small printing firm in Massachusetts. And so I was a teen at that time. And so my summers and like then into college breaks and stuff like that, I worked with him. And that's, I, that's actually where I finally had a little bit of structure. Because uh, as an undergraduate at, at UMass Amherst, I, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, I studied political science and French and Western European studies and a bunch of other stuff. So I, I was a little somewhat directionless. And I remember having a lot of envy uh, for folks that seemed to have their acts together. They knew what they wanted to do. And all of a sudden I was like, all right, whatever. And when I worked with my dad, it provided a little bit of structure. And in a small business, you do everything. You, you're the bottle washer, you, you know, you get the mail and you're, you know, delivering orders and whatnot. And the, the, the customer side, uh, I really, really liked. Uh, so that's probably my first taste of kind of marketing. I, I'd always had summer jobs when I was a kid, paper route, actually scooping ice cream was one of my jobs when I was a teenager, believe it or not. And I, I actually, the, the customer interaction was something I um, thrived on. And that just over time led me more in the marketing direction. And so to then fast forward without worrying with all the details to, to uh, be, to go off, get a master's degree and work in brand, you know, brand management to me, that was uh, a, a special and a big leap for, for me. So to go to a company like Unilever, uh, actually the, at the time it was best foods, uh, it was best, best foods. And then best foods got acquired by, by, uh, by Unilever about 20, actually about 20, 22, 23 years ago. And uh, so, uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff about business that can be a little boring, uh, or can, can be stuffy. And I remember early on, I never really felt that I fit in because I didn't go to Ivy League schools. I, uh, and a lot of people in brand management, brand management had. And so you'd sit around the lunch table like, oh, where'd you go to school? And where'd you go to school? And I'm like, oh. And interestingly, I, and kind of oddly, is that the more I, as my career progressed, the more um, I relaxed and tried to bring more of myself to the work, which includes fun and laughing. I, you, you know, you and I have always been, you know, jokesters. The better the work got. 
And so the older I got, the more I looked back, I said, gosh, I, I, maybe people told me that, but I didn't listen. Uh, the, the, the idea that you know, work doesn't need to be uh, stuffy and difficult. There are, you know, as all, with all organizations, whether they're business or not, they've got their difficult sides or stuffy sides and that's humans working together also create that in, in kind of in, in, in group settings and, and team dynamics and whatnot. But uh, the more fun I have, the better my business results have become. Cool, cool. And I, I love that. And you just said something about team settings and groups. This is the podcast about teams. Uh, so what is the best team you've ever been part of in your life? And be before we before we did the, uh, the intro, welcome to the podcast, we were talking about different things, musical groups and stuff like this. Uh, when I say team, what I mean is any group of two or more people who have a shared goal. Right. So that could be, you know, in my case, sometimes it's me and my wife or it's you and, you and a work team or you and a music group or you and any group of two or more people aligned with a common goal. What's your best team that you've been a member of? Oh, man, that is a very difficult question. And, it, and as you were talking there, you gave me a couple of seconds head start to get the gears clunking around my head. I'll steer clear of uh, my wife references because I could come back to that and talk to that a lot. And, and, I, and I don't want to talk about that as a way to say, well, if you don't talk about your wife, you know, but uh, let's just call that a given because I'm a very lucky guy uh, to, to, to be with my wife. You know, my knee jerk reaction was to talk about businessy stuff. But when I, the way you just explained it, shifted it a bit to me to more playing music with other people. Um, and um, there's not one in particular. It's there's almost a zone that you get in uh, uh, when you're playing with people you like, people you trust, and you're actually just jamming away. Um, it's hard to describe. It's hard to describe to people who don't play music. Maybe they do something else in their life where they kind of get into a shared zone that's a bit beyond the normal language because you're playing music together. And and I'm not a great musician. Uh, and, the, and the people I play with, many of them are, are, are more talented than I am. That's not the point. Um, I'm a big fan of, of, a, of an adage that a friend told me once, well, just make it your own. You know, so sometimes we try to play a song and I want to sound just like whoever wrote it. And so he looked at me once and said, play it, just make it your own, Matthew. And so when you can play, for me, when I can play music with other people that I trust and I feel that I can just be myself, not only do I enjoy it more, but in a weird cosmic way, I think we then send out a signal to the other people that yes, it's an invitation for you to be more like yourself. So for me, the great jam session is one where there's the unspoken kind of mojo of trust isn't a thing, it's more of a continuum. Trust isn't a thing, it's almost like a field, like a magnetic field of trust. And each of the players is contributing to it. Um, and there's a special moment. It doesn't even, you, sometimes we record it and you listen to it. It sounds pretty crappy in hindsight. That, doesn't, that didn't matter at all because the memory of kind of being in the moment with other people. And the, I suppose the, uh, the other adage we, you and I were chatting about was the notion of taking a solo. Uh, and I use this analogy a lot in, in my business work, uh, my teamwork with, with my gang is that, um, Businesses, what we do is, is often like making music together. Some parts are difficult. You have to practice. You have to work on your craft before you get into the team setting. You got to, the person that doesn't practice the song, you, we all know you know that right away. That's the one person that you practice and it goes up immediately. That's kind of the same ways in teams in, in business is everybody has to kind of show up prepared um, and with, with an energy and a desire to, 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 to create a goal, to, to move towards a goal. And the idea of a solo is that uh, the, the, the statement uh, about a, a, a soloist taking a solo is completely wrong. No soloist takes a solo. The other bandmates give them the space to have one and then support them through it. Especially when that soloist may be going to try some things that they've never done before, you actually need the rest of the band to actually support them, not not back away. We all know the edge when someone like does a stage dive and everyone in the audience they either go and catch that person, you also know twenty minutes where someone does a stage dive and everyone moves away. You know, you, that's not a that's not a trusting teamwork. So, <laughs> long answer to your short question. Did, did you know that when I was twenty years old, I. I, I, I was a big aficionado. I was a, I was a master stage diver, except for that one day when nobody caught me. <laughs> and I actually broke my hand. <laughs> Ouch. 
Oh boy. Oh, I met, and I met somebody at a tech conference once and this guy was like, hey, you look familiar. Were you the guy at that show the other night who was doing the st- uh, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I moved back. I made sure I didn't try to catch you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One of these, one of these, I don't, if you can think of a particular one of these music groups that you've been, uh, that you've been with, if you could, all that stuff you were just talking about, if you could summarize all of that sensation of, of being in one of those music groups, one of those best teams uh, into one word, is there, is there a one word that you could use to describe that? The... What does it feel like within you? It's definitely a feeling of peace. peace. Uh, and, and, the, and the peace suggests relaxation. It isn't. Usually when I'm playing with friends, and then particularly to answer you, as you prompted me with the question, there's a, a group of guys I play with, and we play some very loud rock, 70s type of glam rock and punkish type of stuff. And so it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a calm piece, but knowing that you're with people where you can be yourself, I find it incredibly peaceful. It's a high energy piece, but it's definitely a kind of an equilibrium uh, without unnecessary stress. Nice. And, uh, and, and some more about that. Uh, these, these music groups that you, that you play with, um, how do you, We've been talking about peace. We've been talking about like giving space, giving a solo. This trust. Trust is a continuum, not a, not a specific thing. How do you know, subjectively or objectively, that these are great teams, or maybe we can just generalize and say great great experiences with other people? What is it subjectively mm. that lets you know this is this is great? Yeah. Um, so if I come into a group, um, one of the things that uh, that I have found that signals to me that that this is a, a team that's working well together is there's a couple of hallmarks now that, that you're asking. It. One of them is they um, they appear to listen to each other really. They're not cutting each other off, and I'm wicked guilty of cutting people off mid sentence. I've really had to work on that over my career with other men, and of course with 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 with, with, with women. As, as, as we often guys do, but listening. And if people aren't listening, it's almost like press the stop button. You people aren't even listening to each other. What's going on here? So listening is, is one. And at the same time, challenging, being honest, because I think people, I, I, you have to be able to be honest and that includes disagreeing with people. And so if someone says, no, no, the song goes like this, it's an attitude, totally doesn't go like that without making it personal, right? So the minute people make stuff personal, it suggests to me that, that, uh, that, 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 uh, that not only are people not listening, but they're not actually willing to challenge each other in order to create something better together. You know, sometimes people really, and I've been guilty of this more often when I was, when I was younger, but still these days, like, you know, I wanna be right. I've got an idea about what we should do here. Well, that's that's solo playing. <laughs> that's 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 playing by yourself. If you want to play with other people and you want to respect them and you want them to feel valued, then you can't make your idea or your your will superior uh, to others. That doesn't mean you don't challenge each other. You know, people being nice to each other is not the hallmark of a great team. Right? People can be nice to each other and then feel like they actually couldn't speak the truth. Um, and there, there can be kind of a lack of trust there because everyone was just trying to be nice when the reality is sometimes you got to talk about difficult things. So those are probably two, two things that I look for or that jump out to me when I come in into in a team. And then the other one is having fun. You know, if, and that, that's maybe, maybe an overused kind of way of talking about it. But if people are not, I am a firm believer that we humans do our best work when we're happy. It doesn't mean we can't be struggling and having difficulty, but I believe to my core that we humans are do, we do our best work when we're moving towards carrots, not away from sticks. Yeah, I'm totally with you on this. And what about objectively? Like if somebody from outside the group were watching or listening or you know, using their senses, what would be some objective evidence that this was a great team? Mm. Uh, progress. 
progress. What does progress look like? Um, I've, 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 I've worked with teams and I'm sure I've been guilty of been more interested in being right and debate. So I can come into objectively, you see a team and they're spending a lot of time debating. It may be very intelligent debate. It may be rigorous debate. It may be um, well thought through debate. This isn't a debate club. Unless you're in a debate club, that's not what life is really, that's not what a lot of what things we do in life. If the team is not moving the ball forward, I actually don't really care what they're doing. And you know, and again, if it's just a book discussion group and the, the, the goal is to discuss or to debate, that's fine. But if you're in a team that's designed to do something, output and results and progress, particularly consistent progress, you know, anybody can have a really great play where they get the ball really fall far down the field, but the team that's able to move the ball six yards, six yards, six yards, six yards, six yards, that's a winning team. That's, that's no matter what the competition tries to shift and change the team that can constantly move the ball down the field that to me. So output, you know, it's like a joke. You don't measure how great the ice cream is by what goes into the pint. You measure it by how great it tastes when you stick your spoon in and you put exactly. it in, right so, so it's, a, it's some people i find are let's talk about the ingredients or let's talk about you know let's talk about the ingredients going into the pint you really measure what comes out of the oven that's really what the good stuff is oh well, this is so great and in, in, in my world working with a lot of tech companies it's like engineers endlessly debating the best algorithm or the right tools to use and the right programming language but all that really matters is you can get stuff done deliver it to people and they love it right yeah. Yes. <laughs> so building software is just like building ice cream. It turns out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do not doubt this. <laughs> or making music, right? Or making music. Uh, what are when you, when you, when you think about some of these music groups that you're part of, or, or any any of the the best teams you've been on? What are what are three concrete behaviors that uh, that that somebody could notice? Like three very concrete things that people do in these groups. They talk about and ideally agree on what they're trying to do together. Uh -huh. What does success look like here? And even if it's a jam together, the success is we just want to have a good time. Fine. But if two of the people think success is writing a new song and getting it recorded in that session, and the other two are like, man, I, I just brought a 12 pack of beer. We're just here to have a good time. You're going to have a problem, right? So people that, that, I, that, that I did that notice the importance and actually then make it clear, well, what are we trying to accomplish here? Um, I know that sounds super basic, but I've seen lots of groups. I've been part of groups that they're going in circles and it's not because they're bad people or they're not talented. Mm -hmm. They actually don't have a shared sense of what the what success looks like. So the first thing is, is goal setting and sharing in that. And I see so many people debate what they're trying to accomplish. That's like, you know, as my dad would always say, you can run around on the dock all you want, you know, folding the sails and rolling up the, the, the ropes and putting them in a perfect order. Unless you put get on the boat, push away from the dock, you're not sailing. Right. So you kind of have to have an objective of what you're trying to do or else you're just kind of going around in circles. That's that's one objective. I think you asked for three. Sure. I'll take three. <laughs> Did you not say three? Did I just make that yeah, up? I said three. I'll take what you got. <laughs> that's a really good one. <laughs> I'm making it up as I go, dude. That's um, a really good so one. They, they had a shared. The, the second one is they ask questions. Uh -huh. They ask questions. You know, questions unlock the power of the mind. Questions unlock the power of each other's minds. Um, you know, inquiry. Uh, there's very great, very few great things in life don't start with a question. Yeah. All right. And and so people people and and I am super guilty of this. You know, when you go, sometimes you go into a um, a team building workshop or whatnot, and they put you into groups and they give you a, a puzzle to solve. And like, okay, we're gonna give you like five yeah, uh, 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 straws, uh, a piece, uh, uh, a piece of cloth, uh, yeah. some tape, and good luck, you know. And uh, and immediately, uh, sometimes people just try to rush to the solution. Uh, and that that's I think it's human nature, particularly people that that have a high drive for success or accomplishment, but asking questions not only triggers um, the mind to, to, to wonder a yep. bit and to say, oh, what, what, what could we do here? Um, it also is, it shows generosity. Oh. Questions says you actually care what other people think. 
And, and I find that, that often that's kind of one of the, the, the lesser discussed benefits is that I I would, if I ask you a question, I think I'm showing you a bit more respect and that I actually care what you think. Mm -hmm. Then if I just say, great, let's start. I have an idea. Let's do this. And uh, third one, I don't know, maybe, maybe conflict, people, you know, seeing how people resolve a difference. So if one person says that two people want to do it this way and two people want to do it that way, you can almost kind of sit back and go, how are they going to, who's going to win here? Because it's kind of human nature to want to win. Yeah. It's kind of you want your idea to be the one that gets picked or the one that gets selected. And particularly if groups are divided, do they resolve it or do they collapse? Right. Do they, they literally run into an impasse that they themselves have created? Or do they say, well, in order to do number one, which is the shared goal, what, we're going to have to make a decision here. Uh, those are three behaviors. I think. <laughs> awesome. the, the thing about asking questions, because I, I, I'm, I'm, we, we started by talking about music, I'm curious about this. Is there a is there a musical way to ask questions that doesn't involve using speech? You mean when you're jamming? Yeah, when you're actually doing the music versus like talking about it before you do the music. Oh man, that is a good question. I don't know, and I'm not going to pretend to know. But the thought that jumped into my head as you were t as you were asking it was the in the device of call and response in music, yeah. right? And sometimes you don't have to say, "Hey, everybody, repeat after me." Right. Sometimes I've seen this. We want to watch a band, and then the singer just goes, "Ayo," and everybody goes, "Ayo." Oh. Yeah, is and so there's. I'm so sorry, did you did you say something? <laughs> <laughs> It was at that moment that the podcast went completely <laughs> off the rails. <laughs> now I don't know how we would do call and response in a team, oh. a team, a team environment. I guess maybe through questions, like, "Oh, hey, what do you think? What do you think?" Yeah. Uh, but there is something to be said for, you know, I'm uh, thinking about like kind of a mother duck and all their ducklings, and the mother duck kind of jumps into the water, yeah. and all the things are kind of gathered around the edge of the you know that maybe a little like a ledge that goes into a water area and they're all not sure what to do but, yeah. but mother can can only encourage like okay we're right. we come on we gotta get going and then one duck jumps in and the next thing you know they all start jumping in and i think uh, sometimes you don't have to be what, what you would define in your head is a natural leader or always the leader very often people are looking for someone to lead and it doesn't have to be the same person every time. In fact, it kind of gets boring if the same person takes that first plunge on every project, on every part of your organization. In fact, very often I've underestimated other people were kind of hoping that somebody would take the leap. And when I was that person, particularly when I lacked the confidence and I was like, ooh, who's going to leap first here? And I said, well, I'm just going to go for it. Uh, usually I was self-conscious. I wasn't sure if I was going to fall on my face, whatever it was. And then all of a sudden people jumped in behind me and they're like, oh, I'm glad you jumped in. <laughs> and I didn't think about that because I think I was too absorbed in my own either self-consciousness or do I have the skills to make this jump or what if I fall on my face? And so in a weird way, I was kind of absorbed often, you know, often in my life absorbed by my own narrative in my head about whether or not I should leap. Yeah. And then once I left, I completely was clueless that a lot of other people left after me just because they saw me leap. And I, you know, and I'm not always the person who leaps first. And so I would encourage, I try to encourage people to think about, you never know who's watching you and hoping that you'll be the one that leaps. And if you go, they'll go behind you. They'll never tell you that. They'll, they won't usually in group settings. And so sometimes just being the one that leaps and oh, that's so interesting. encourages other people to do the same. Yeah. No, Nobody ever says, "Go ahead. If if, if you leap first, I'll um I'll I'll probably follow right behind." <laughs> if they do, we get a little nervous, don't we? <laughs> yeah. It sounds Wait so artificial. Like, no, now I don't believe you. <laughs> you know something I don't, and that's down in the water. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead. You go first. <laughs> How about some advice for listeners? Uh, to 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 reproduce some of the success in great teams that we've been talking about today. I uh, you know this particularly this past year uh, with uh, the you know the, the pain and the suffering of the COVID virus everywhere around the world. I mean, I'm I'm very fortunate to be part of a a business that that we were in in 
in many countries around the world. And so I've had the opportunity to, to work with lots of different people on my team at the same time to see just the, the level of kind of crisis and pain and suffering that's come because of the COVID um, pandemic. And um, uh, there, are, there are gifts within even a crisis, but you just gotta go looking for them um, uh, because they're not right out there. They're usually the difficult things, the painful things are the ones that are confronting us uh, hour to hour or day to day in a, in a, in a pandemic uh, like we've been seeing and that none of us have experienced in our lifetimes. One of the things that's become really, really clear to me um, through last year, um, uh, kind of almost starting at this moment a year ago, was the power of compassion and that compassion uh, truly is a business imperative. Um, and if you had asked me, if you had kind of said that line to me, uh, I don't know, a year, a few years ago, I would probably think you were describing a poster outside of the human resources department or one of those, you know, teamwork, yay, and some happy people jumping or whatnot. But what I have found is that compassion truly is a business imperative. If people aren't taking care of themselves, if they're not taking care of each other, if they're not looking after their family and the stuff that matters most, I mean, you know, you, you and I are in each other's homes right now to a certain degree. And I think that the pandemic has uh, somewhat sliced a hole between that, 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 that false veil between our work lives and our live lives. And so the idea of compassion you know, if people aren't taking care of themselves, they're not taking care of their families, their loved ones, their communities, um, then forget about the ice cream. And, and, and now that sounds almost basic to say, but that's not often how business operates. It's like, well, we got to make ice cream. We got to do whatever we got to do. And the reality is, no, no, we don't. And we don't. What we have to do is we have to take care of people and make sure that they have what they need to, 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 to be safe, to be healthy, to thrive. Um, and so if you'd asked me that, I think this idea of compassion is a business imperative. And then also, um, while the compassion side may, may sound kind of touchy feely or be kind of a soft skill type of a thing, um, it takes vigilance to bring compassion. So particularly in crisis. So when you think about um, needing to do the right things and take decisions quickly in a crisis situation, particularly when it relates to people's lives um, and their safety and their health, um, like uh, uh, you know, keeping your place of work safe, sending people home, following the right protocol from the World Health Organization or the CDC that has been constantly evolving over the past year, um, it requires vigilance. And so never before in my life did I learn, did I see or experience or learn the importance of, 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 of compassion at the same time as vigilance, this need, this need to be vigilant, vigilant to protect your people, vigilant to protect your teammates, vigilant to protect your business uh, because, because uh, people's livelihoods uh, also matter. They don't matter as much as lives. We talk about many, many of the consultants, many of the analysts, many of the people who have studied kind of, um, of uh, the, the you know, organizations thriving or failing to thrive through the pandemic. Talk about lives and livelihoods. That lives, that's the number one focus. And then after that, livelihoods, because if people don't know how they're going to pay their rent, if people don't know how they're going to make sure that their heat is on, make sure that um, can have food, um, livelihood does matter and your job or your career or your vocation is one part of that. And so that connection of kind of compassion is a business imperative and the need for vigilance to really fight very hard uh, and to be working very hard to, to, um, uh, uh, to take decisive action. Um, I used to think those were kind of inversely related, you know, this idea of vulnerability and vigilance, you know, People need to show that they're vulnerable. It's okay. It's okay to, to cry. It's okay to feel stress. There's a, it's, there's a lot of conversation there has been, and there needs to be more of it around psychological health, mental well being. Um, people are struggling. They're struggling badly. So, this idea of vulnerability is, is part of compassion and being vigilant. Being vigilant to say, no, we're not going to do it that way. No, we're not going to open the office. No, you're not going to work. No, we will not open if we don't have the proper protective equipment, whatever it might be, even though there may be other pressures like, well, what about this? What do we tell our customers or whatnot? Sometimes you just have to try to make things black and white, particularly through a crisis, so you can try to do what you think is right. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Anything 
anything else interesting you're working on any music anything at all yeah 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 give me one thing uh, ben and jerry's one of the things I've, I've been learning a lot about is um are, are, are all the things that ben and jerry's been fighting for for over four decades topics issues around social justice and climate justice and to be honest with you i spent most of my life really not understanding this type of stuff and i gradually became much more interested in, in my career. And I think that's the reason why I ended up at Ben and Jerry's to kind of answer your, your earlier question is that in hindsight, things are clear to me why I'm here because just selling stuff, um, you know, a number of years ago just wasn't turning me on as much. And I found that I, I wanted to use uh, the stuff that I was doing every day to try to do um, more good um, without overstating it uh, through the business uh, and, and the, the businesses and the brands that have been part of it at Unilever. And Ben and Jerry's gives, uh, gives the team, gives me a tremendous opportunity, a tremendous privilege uh, to learn about topics uh, such as white supremacy culture, uh, white male privilege, uh, systemic racism, um, uh, the, the, the very nature of trying to make Ben and Jerry's an anti-racist company uh, and um, as, a, as a very white business that was founded in the second whitest state and still is very white today. Uh, you know, being white is not bad. Um, and I don't feel any shame about being a white guy. The only shame I think I should feel is that if I fail to recognize the privilege that I have in this, in this society uh, and doing something to, to, to confront um, those systemic things that give me advantage and that actively and persistently disadvantage other people, particularly black people, indigenous, other people of color. Um, and I'm, again, I'm no expert in these topics, but I'm learning kind of day by day. And the teamwork is also central here as well. You know, the old adage that, um, you know, many shovels make, many hands make light work and many shovels are required to move them out. And so, so the challenges that we're facing uh, around us, uh, whether they're related to racial equity, um, uh, uh, LGBTQ rights, um, refugees, um, climate uh, issues. These are things that, that we at Ben and Jerry's have been working on for, for many years. Only through teamwork can we hope to have any progress. Um, I'm just one person. Uh, I happen to have a, a kind of a, a fancy title, but I'm just one person. And, and there's this mythology about kind of hierarchy. You know, the reality I found is that the higher you go, the less you know. And that becomes poor every day with the pace of the world and business moving quickly. So there's a bit, there's a bit of a democratizing force where um, people at the top of organizations are often the least qualified to help the organization kind of move, more shift, transform. And this is also true for issues around social and climate justice. Um, we can only do these things by doing them together. And so this nature of collaboration within teams is also is, is important, but the kind of change that we need to have in the world to, to tackle these big, big systemic problems, we're gonna to have to work more together. So actually I think the skill set of teamwork uh, has never been more important. I, I've learned that you can't be neutral on a moving train. And, uh, and this idea that you're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. And that when you declare that you want to be neutral, you're actually declaring that you're okay with the status quo, including if the status quo oppresses people or is bad for the environment. And, and, I, and I, I have to confess, for a lot of my life, I was someone that just said, well, I just want to stay neutral on this. I'm not going to get involved. And the reality is you, you, that you're basically making a strong declaration that you're perfectly comfortable that white people should have what they have and black people shouldn't that the environment should be polluted and you're okay with that. And so um, uh, I would encourage people to, to find a way to do something, particularly through their vocation, through their work, that not only does the day stuff, but actually is having an active positive impact on something that you care about. It doesn't actually matter exactly what it is. We do certain things at Ben and Jerry's, uh, but, but, but really you, you can do both. 
You can do your work, you can do your vocation, you can do your business, assuming that it isn't already part of solving a, a, a climate or a social injustice, but you can do those things. And that often can create even stronger teamwork because people, uh, Ben Ben, Ben Cohen, uh, one of our co-founders of Ben and Jerry's was famous for saying, you know, the strongest bonds you can form with your, your fans or your consumers are over shared values. And your shared values are not things you just talk about, but the things that you're willing to take action on. All right. That is so well said. Thank you for all of that. And if, if, uh, if listeners and viewers want to want to learn more, learn more about you, learn more about Ben and & Jerry's and, and, and the, the mission that goes beyond ice cream, the mission that goes beyond making music with friends and acquaintances, uh, is there a website? Is there some way they can get in touch or learn more? Yeah, sure. You can just go to our Ben and just put in your browser, benandjerrys.com, uh, and, and you'll go to our website. You can learn about not only our ice cream, but all the things that we're doing. Um, you can follow us on Twitter. You can follow us on Instagram. Um, it, we don't we don't hide the stuff that we're trying to do, um, and uh, we certainly welcome folks to engage with us or give us criticism. I'm all about constructive criticism. I got people telling me they don't like stuff we're doing every day. That's perfectly fine too. But thankfully we get, we have more fans that are supporting the work we're doing. Yeah, just go to our website. That's probably the easiest way to get info. Awesome. Thank you so much. Matt Matthew, this has been a, a really great pleasure. I, I've, we, we haven't talked in, a, in quite a while and it's, it's been awesome catching up. I, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This has been, the feeling is nothing short of mutual. <laughs> And listeners and viewers, remember to support this podcast. Visit my website, kasparowski.com.